morning, I want to ask you if you have ever received an extravagant gift. Now, on the way here this morning, we were listening to some music that reminded me that sometimes we hear or see extravagant gifts being given in the movies or in books or, or in plays or on TV. We were listening to, to Les Mis. You know, there's a new movie out. I don't know if you've seen it or have seen the old one or the play. Uh, but in this movie, there are several extravagant gifts given. One of them is a priest gives a gift to a man who is actually stealing from him at the time. And then there are other gifts. There, there are gifts of life that are given, people rescuing each other and, and doing heroic things for each other. These are all extravagant gifts. Now, if you haven't seen that movie, perhaps you remember It's a Wonderful Life. And at the end of that movie, there's an extravagant gift. And it was, it was life-changing to the character in the movie who, who was so depressed about his situation that his friends and family and neighbors came to his rescue with a very extravagant gift. I want to tell you about a time when I got a very, very extravagant gift, or it was for me. One year at Christmas, my husband and I had decided that we weren't going to buy big gifts for each other. We really didn't want very much. We didn't have any unmet needs. And so we decided we would maybe get little things for each other. I think I got him socks. Now, they were really nice socks, but yeah, they were socks. So our focus that year was on just making Christmas special and celebrating the, the true meaning of the season and celebrating Christ's birth and, and making our, sure our sons had a happy Christmas. So that Christmas morning, the boys had opened their presents and I was sitting in the living room and in amongst all that glorious debris on Christmas morning, that lazy, leisurely feeling of being able just to bask in the warmth of the day. And I heard some noise upstairs. Then I saw my husband and my sons coming down the stairs with something very large and they told me to close my eyes. Now when I opened my eyes, I looked up and in front of me was this huge, beautiful painting from one of my favorite local artists. Now you see my husband and I had been to an art show and we had seen these paintings and, and I just said, kind of in passing, oh, if I could ever have one of these paintings, one of this artist's paintings, this one would be it and I know just where I would hang it. Now I had never thought that he was really paying attention to what, what I was saying or, or making note of it anyway. It's just a passing comment. So I was very surprised and very touched that he bought this gift for me. And my reaction, I burst into tears. And they were tears of pure joy that he thought my happiness was worth this extravagant gift. And you know, I see that painting every day. It hangs in that spot in our living room. And it reminds me that my husband loves me so very much. Now, on that Christmas morning, if we had had an accountant or a financial manager there with us, they would not have approved of this very wasteful, extravagant gift. Has someone ever given you an impractical, extravagant, maybe wasteful gift just to bring you joy and happiness? In our text this morning from John, Mary does give an extravagant gift. In, in my own terms and how I think about the scripture, I see it like this. Jesus has come back to Bethany, and it's right before Passover. Now, if we go back to chapter, the chapter right before this in John, we would see the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And now the same Lazarus is there. He's going to be at the dinner table. I want you to picture it if you could. Martha has been rushing around trying to get everything ready for Passover. There was a lot of ritual cleaning that needed to be done for this week-long celebration. And it meant that she had to, among other things, get rid of every bit of leavening and flour in the house. It was a time for, for their families to remember God's act of mercy in freeing the children of Israel from slavery and of saving those firstborn sons and setting in action that long, long trip that they took through the wilderness to the Promised Land. And for Martha, it would probably be all about the cooking and the cleaning, don't you think, for what we know of her. And then they learn that Jesus will be joining them. So how do you thank someone for bringing your brother back from the dead? For Martha, it was a well-cooked meal, a dinner party. 
But I think about Mary, and I imagine what she might have been thinking that she could do to, to recognize and praise the man, to praise her Lord and Savior for bringing her brother back from the dead. Now I imagine she was running late. And in my mind, now don't look for this in your Bible, you won't find this in there, but just supposing that, that she is looking for money, Mary might have been out in town hawking her great-grandma's wedding ring in order to have enough money to purchase this expensive perfume. That's how I think of the character of Mary. She, she is doing what she can to thank Jesus for bringing her brother back to her. And then she comes rushing in. She's not helped with any of the preparations, I'll bet. And she comes rushing into the dinner party, and before anyone can stop her, she is kneeling at Jesus' feet. Now, if you remember from before, her sister was a little angry with her for spending so much time at Jesus' feet to listen to what he had to say while she was doing all the preparations at another time. But this time, she is not kneeling to listen to what the Master is saying. She is kneeling to anoint his feet with this precious perfume. She breaks open that alabaster jar, and the room is filled with this wonderful scent. And then she does something even more shocking, uh, because the custom was for her hair probably would have been up and hidden. She takes her hair, her long hair down, and she wipes Jesus' feet with, with her hair. She dries his feet with her hair. Now, Martha is not the one who gets so upset this time. This time it's Judas. Judas is enraged and he snaps at her. Now, have you ever known anyone who liked to point the finger at someone else when they were at fault? Sometimes we do that to try to deflect attention. I think Judas probably knew that he was the real scoundrel in the room. He was the thief. He was the one who would be betraying Jesus. Yet it is Judas who acts enraged and raises a stink about Mary's actions. And then, and then Jesus, his rebuke. Leave her alone. The day-to-day -day needs of the poor will always be among us, but I will not be. This woman, among all of you, sees prophetically and sees what must happen, sees that my raising of Lazarus has, has triggered actions that are going to result in my death, my sacrifice. It will be upon us soon. So what does this scripture, what does this text tell us about the nature of extravagant gifts? You see, the real extravagant gift would come very, very soon. In the next few chapters of John, if we read on, there is the Last Supper. Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. He has predictions of betrayal and Peter's denial of him. And then the chapters that follow rush to tell the disciples everything they need to know about the coming events and what they should do afterwards. And then Jesus' death and suffering, his sacrifice, and his resurrection. Now that is the real extravagant gift. It's the gift of God's Son, the promise of God's eternal mercy and grace. You know, not long ago, I found myself struggling with so many things in my life that I lost my balance a little bit. And I'll tell you what I mean. I felt overcome with several situations. And the biggest one for me at the time had to do with my parents. You see, as they have aged at 90 and 84, they are in, in different stages of dementia and physical decline. And while we had been caring for them at their home, it became necessary to move them to assisted living. And this was a very difficult experience for me and for my family. I felt overcome with, with having to do all the things that we had to do and with their resistance to the move. Now at the same time, my oldest son, the one who is not here with us today, was contemplating a move and trying to put that into action. And there were a lot of details to be worked out and some decisions to be made, and that caused some stress as well. Luckily, the one that's sitting here in front of us was causing me no stress at the time. In fact, he was a great support. But there were a lot of things going on. And then, vocationally, uh, you heard just a little bit that I work at the Humar Arts Center in Lincolnton. We had some staff changes. My friend who is here with us today found it necessary to move and, and take care of her father and transfer to another arts center. 
and we, we had to say goodbye to two other treasured staff members and welcome two new ones. Now the changes were sad, but, but the changes in, in some ways, we welcomed the new folks and it has all worked out fine. But when you have a change like that going on at home, and then you have a change going on like that in your extended family, and a change going on like that vocationally, the stress of it can really get to you, and it did to me. In fact, I found myself uh, physically sick because I was just so worn down from it. Now I had one more thing that was a little bit of a stress, and I heard you mention this morning you talked about your pastor going before the Board of Ordained Ministry. Um, as a commissioned deacon, I have done that once already and have been commissioned. But in, in that interim time when, between commissioning and full connection ordination, there's a process that I didn't know anything about before. But part of that process is that we meet with a group of clergy uh, peers who are also at the same point in that process. We meet almost once a month for three years. And we have a, a mentor who works with us, someone who's already fully ordained, who works with us. And we work on, on sharing our, our joys and our frustrations um, of ministry. And we work on helping each other with our skills. Now, it so happened at this time that I was scheduled to be one of the ones who presented my sermon to this group in order for them to critique the sermon and to, to give me advice about any changes that I might need to make. That also is a part of what I will do when I go back before the board and, and uh, what Karen has done to go before the board is prepare a sermon that the board critiques as well. So this is very important and these meetings are mandatory. I mean the bishop says you must go to these meetings, period. So what happened to me during this very, very stressful time, something terrible happened. I was at work, but I was sick, and I was trying to make arrangements to see a doctor and leave. And I got a text from one of my friends that's in that clergy group, and she said, we are meeting. Where are you? Oh, my goodness. I, I just felt my heart drop. I could not believe that I had let something this important slip. I was devastated. I didn't know what I was going to have to do to make this up. I had not even communicated to the group that I was sick. Now likely I would not have been able to go anyway because I did end up going to the doctor. And I spent some time resting at home and the next day I had a bad reaction to some of the medicine. But when I finally was able to sit up and be well enough to take a look at my email, um, I, had, I had contacted them, I texted her back to let her know I was sick. The leader of the group, our, our mentor of the group, had emailed me back and she said, we prayed for you and we hope that your stress will get better soon and that you will, you will be able to be physically well and have stress removed as well. And she said, we will work out the details of rescheduling when you will present your sermon to the group. And then I read the last words of her email and tears flooded my eyes. It was very simple. She said, grace abounds. You see, I deeply regretted my actions. I deeply regretted not even letting them know that I was not well and missing a, a meeting that was so important. And I didn't deserve to have any grace given to me, any exception given to me. I should have communicated. I should have at least called or emailed or texted to let them know that I was sick. But what I got instead of punishment was this gift. And it was like a flood releasing from me. And I thought at that time, I said, this is what it's like for a lot of people when they hear for the first time of God's eternal grace and his forgiveness. This must be what it's like. It's been so long ago since I came to know God. I, I grew up as a Christian. So I've, I've not had these kind of moments very often in my life when I feel the pressure drop away and the grace that is there. This is what this text says to me today. And another minister wrote, and his name is Dr. Delmer Chilton. He had this to say. This text calls us to a deep, deep grief for the death of Jesus, a profound and abiding sorrow for our faults and failures, our evil deeds and iniquitous acts. In a word, our sins that put him on the cross to bleed and die and save us from ourselves. 
It also calls us to a full and rich and sober joy and gratitude for the new life that Christ won for us there. Martin Luther called it a sacred exchange, a divine trade. On the cross, Jesus took on our sins and gave us his holiness. Upon the cross, Jesus died our death and gave us his life. There on that tree, Jesus accepted our fate and gave us his future. And in response, we are called to weep for our sins and his death, and then to pour out our lives in service of Christ for service to the needy and poor of the world. Grace abounds indeed. You see, we, the body of Christ, broken, corrupt, yes, sinful people, but forgiven, are offered this extravagant gift of God's eternal grace. We are called to share this gift with the broken world, with the poor, with the needy. We are called to love with God's kind of extravagance, God's unflinching love, a gift to remind people that they are loved, that they, too, are redeemed. Grace abounds. Go then and hurry, for, for there are people who desperately need to hear this news. Those who think they have messed up so badly that no one could ever love them. Those who think that the world has forgotten them. Those who need the gift of this extravagant gift of grace very badly. Tell them, tell them in how you live every day by making an extravagant gift of your time and your resources and your words. Grace abounds. It's too good not to share. Let us, as Lent draws to a close, remember to mourn the death of Christ, to feel deeply our inadequacies, our failures, our sins, but to know that there is hope, there is joy, and it is ours to share. Let us thank God for this extravagant, undeserved gift. Grace abounds. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.